Welcome to This Week in South Carolina. I'm Gavin Jackson. This week, more businesses across the state open for business as the state gradually returns to normal. And the governor had the last meeting of his Accelerate SC task force, which is charged with finding ways to gradually bring the state back to where it was before COVID-19. Here's the latest from this week. Close contact businesses across the state were able to reopen this week with guidelines for places like Circa Barbershop in Columbia to follow to limit the spread of COVID-19. Barber D.R. Granger said he's increased already stringent sanitation protocols and put in additional precautions for fellow barbers at Circa Barbershops in Greenville and Charleston as well. Um, and what we'll do is we'll kind of ease it out. We've got some barbers working two and three days a week. Uh, and kind of ramping, doing a little bit longer days on those days that they're in the shop and we're not running at full capacity. And then we'll review it over the next week to two weeks and then we'll slowly start opening up uh, more times for bookings. The booking was um, crazy as soon as the website, you know, as soon as the governor announced, we uh, made a post through social media and then within, you know, it was kind of crazy within a couple of hours, it was like three weeks were full and, you know, people were like, you know, what's going on with the website? It's not showing any availability. So that was, that was really cool to see just like the support that we have from our customers and we have so many loyal clients and friends. With face masks being recommended, Governor Henry McMaster last week toured a local company, Zverse, a manufacturing technology firm in West Columbia, that has moved into production of face shields and a new shield for personal wear and practical use for those in the service industry, such as restaurant workers and grocery store employees. We, we need a, a supply of personal protective equipment and it, it, we're bringing it in uh, from all over. And uh, a lot of it comes through the emergency management division. A lot goes straight to the hospitals and, and other people who order it. But this, this, having this located here uh, gives us a, a comfort and also the, the innovation and, and uh, the thought, the thinking that went into it, again, gives us one more option of way to, to, to accelerate back into our full prosperity safely. This week, the Accelerate SC task force wrapped up its business in a formal report on getting the state back on track economically, as well as recommendations on how to use dedicated COVID-19 federal funding will soon be released. But even with the moves to reopen the state, McMaster stressed caution, especially in light of crowded beaches last weekend and more expected this holiday weekend, along with the opening of attractions. I want to remind everybody that this is a dangerous, dangerous disease, a dangerous virus, and things that we may have done before for out of courtesy and, and good manners that were matters of, of courtesy and good manners are now actually matters of life and death. And joining me to recap the 2020 legislative session are reporters Jeffrey Collins with the Associated Press and Mayan Schechter with the State Newspaper. Thank you both for being here. I appreciate it. Hi, Gavin. Good to see you. <laughs> hey, Gavin. Uh, you know, it's good to see some familiar faces. Uh, you know, it's like we went right from February, the primaries, right on to this COVID-19 situation. So we really haven't had much going on at the State House, except really recently, Jeffrey, when we looked at what happened um, last week with the continuing resolution that got passed, kind of give us an idea about what was the importance about that and why we needed that to pass and, and where that puts us right now as a state. Well, the state needs a budget to be able to run after June 30th, which is the end of this physical year. And so you, they had to pass a continuing resolution because no one really has any idea how much money the state will have to spend in the next physical year that starts July 1st. What the continuing resolution does is it allows the state to continue spending on its current levels after July 1st when the new fiscal year starts. Right now the legislature's plan is to write a new budget. The budget passed the House right before the virus just changed everything. So the budget will start all over again in the Senate. They'll just take the budget and wipe it clean and start all over again, more or less. I mean, there'll be still be plenty of things that they keep, but they'll have to, all that extra spending, they'll have to figure out what to do with that. So it starts over again in the Senate, probably when they have that special session in September. The resolution they passed had a few other things above and beyond that uh, read that will, um, allowance to keep spending after July 1st. There's money for some COVID stuff. There is, um, Santee Cooper gets frozen in place more or less. They can't make any big moves until, of course, they get the deal with Santee Cooper in the 2021 session more than likely. And there was also uh, a very important point that allows uh, furloughs for uh, state agencies if they need to make it. The budget situation gets really, really sour. 
And maybe the best, uh, the, the, the biggest change in the continued resolution is instead of the governor having full authority or maybe like a small group of legislatures being able to have oversight in the more than $2 billion worth of federal money that's coming into the state to pay for virus stuff, now under this new resolution, the uh, full General Assembly will get to its say after the governor makes the suggestions, just like a little mini budget, essentially. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> in my own, Jeffrey just laid out a lot of those uh, continuing resolution items. There were some other big, big top dollar funding priorities in there, too, when we looked at uh, money for, you know, contact tracing and testing. Kind of give us an idea about what other additional money was in there, Mayan, for, for these COVID-19 related response items and where that money is coming from and how we're affording this. Right. So uh, aside from the $155 million that went to COVID-19 response, and that's coming out of the state's surplus dollars, those one-time uh, reserve dollars, we also saw $25 million for the Medical University of South Carolina to assist uh, the South Carolina Department of Health and Environmental Control with that statewide COVID-19 testing. We've heard DHEC say over and over that they're hoping to, and they're getting close to, as I understand, a 2% uh, goal of, of the state's population of testing. So uh, that money is supposed to help MUSC get into those communities, those areas that are probably under tested. Um, and then there's also roughly up to $15 million that the state election commission uh, can use to help out with the June primary election, the subsequent runoff, and then also the November election. There's obviously been a lot of concern about the safety and health of voters, but also poll workers. And so uh, the state election commission is hoping to use a lot of that money to ensure that the elections go smoothly and everybody, nobody catches COVID-19 at the polls. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so yeah, a lot of, there was a lot of back and forth, but that got uh, approved by the governor. And like Jeffrey was talking about, there are some strings attached to that, the power and the oversight we can talk about in a minute. But Jeffrey, when we look at, um, I, we had a clip from House Budget Committee Chairman Merle Smith last week where he was talking about, you know, we don't expect budget cuts. You were talking about how they're going to have to pass a budget in September when they come back. All the lawmakers are coming back. They'll have a better idea about where things stand. It sounds, they, they, you know, it's not too dire sounding from what we're hearing. Obviously, it's still kind of unknown about what the revenues are going to be looking like as we go ahead. But it sounded like there is some cushion that will still be there that they can still play with. Because like you're saying, furloughs is a po are a possibility, but we don't hear anything about drastic budget cuts at this point. What are the revenues mm -hmm. looking like, too? Well, actually, yeah, that's the thing about the furloughs. They're out there, but, I mean, there's been no indication from any state agencies that they may take them. Education is a whole different matter. There may mm -hmm. be some higher education situations. I mean, you know, the University of South Carolina, the basketball coaches, both men and women, the football coach, the president, and several other senior folks took $1.2 million worth of pay cuts, cut their salary by 10%. So education, higher education maybe has some more difficulty. State government, not so much. But the revenue... Uh, projections even now after all the unemployment and everything that's gone on in the past two months still have a South Carolina essentially actually still getting a little extra revenue above and beyond what they had in this current physical year and even I think if it slides back to being even in other words we fully expect this year's budget and next year's budget to say the same I think there will be some state agencies that gladly take it compared to other states around here South Carolina was doing was booming and doing very good economically and it gave them some cushion for what happened in the past two months yeah, some encouraging news there when you're talking about, you know, some things kind of maintaining at least, and then you factor in all this, you know, federal money that's coming here that will help backfill some of these agencies and backfill some of these programs and emergency funding. Uh, it seems like things, if they don't get any worse, could be okay for the most part. So that's kind of encouraging to see. Yeah, well, well the, the, you know, that, that, it's the, all the unknowns out there, though. I mean, we know it's, uh, you know, we're sitting here and it looks like things are going to reopen and, and, you know, it looks like things are, there's an upswing to things, but Mm -hmm. You know, if there's anything that you've learned in the past two months, it's, it's trying to predict anything beyond, I don't know, after I'm done with this, I'm going to go get me some lunch. Predicting <laughs> yeah. anything beyond that is a, is a is dangerous business. Mm -hmm. And Mayan, just to wrap up this section before we talk about uh, Accelerate SC and the, the federal money coming into the state, I want to get your thoughts on I mean, We just saw all these big ticket items uh, that were in the budget that passed, like Jeffrey was saying, you covered the budget too, that was passed right before all, all everything kind of hit pause in the state. And we had teacher pay raises, we had state employee pay raises, we had $100 million going towards state prisons. Uh, just what, what do we expect lawmakers to do when they come back in September and they do say, okay, things have settled a little bit, maybe we have a better idea about where funding's looking like. What, do you, what happens to these priorities that we saw get passed by the House that you know now sits in the Senate and TBD come September? 
Yeah, without knowing the the full revenue projections, I think lawmakers, especially budget writers, are very hesitant to uh, uh, show off confidence that they're going to be able to fill fulfill some of those big ticket items, like you mentioned. You know, putting more money toward uh, infrastructure improvements that had been on um, the books for years, putting more money to state employee uh, merit pay raises or other state employee pay raises, uh, teacher pay raises. Uh, I, I think that there's going to be a, a pretty heavy concentration on really just in ensuring that the basic state services can be funded. I think there's going to be a heavy concentration on ensuring that um, state health care plans, uh, things like that, are going to be able to be funded. I mean, think we also there's also uh, maybe a need for uh, raising the money that's in the unemployment trust fund um, that could happen beyond just the, the CARES Act money that comes down. So without knowing full projections, I think it's been very difficult for lawmakers to just come out publicly and say, yeah, I think we're going to have all this money to do all these things. I just mm -hmm. don't think that's a reality. And when I've talked to uh, senators, I mean, they really see, as, as you both have mentioned, that they're going to have to start completely over. I mean, a lot of the big ticket items that the House passed, I mean, that's just, that's March. And, and that is not what September is probably going to look like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, especially when you're looking at, you know, back in March with the $1.8 billion in extra money that they had to budget with, which has since dwindled down and we'll get more ideas once we get to September. But Jeffrey, looking to June, um, we talk about the Accelerate SC meeting and we talk about the CARES Act funding, the $1.9 billion coming to the state uh, and how that gets spent. We did see some recommendations come out this week from Accelerate SC and the governor. Uh, you know, there's some more further refinements to those projections. Tell us a little bit about what we can expect to see lawmakers do when they return in June to take up a, a future funding plan that we expect to see from the governor maybe next week, the week after that, in terms of how this $1.9 billion uh, gets, gets allocated, essentially. Yeah, I think there's going to be two things they want to do in June. They want to pass this little COVID-19 mini budget, you know, where they, where they all that $2, million, $2 billion plus in federal money gets rolled out. You know, I think they want, the discussion to accelerate SC was about $500 million would replenish the unemployment trust fund that's obviously going to dwindle over the next several months. Um, there was other money that well, they wanted to give to, uh, there, there's several different little pots of money that they want to give, so I think they'll deal with that. I think they'll also need to deal with um, basically some kind of law, law that um, some, of, some other states have dealt with, and that's, you know, liability. In other words, being able to eliminate the liability of businesses in other places if they take all the precautions they are supposed to take to prevent, you know, COVID-19 infections or spreads of the disease. So if they take those, then they aren't liable, they can't be sued. I think you'll see South Carolina take that up too and do that fairly quickly. Mm -hmm. And um, so then we'll see them come back and, and like we said, right after the June 9th primaries that week afterwards, Mayan. And I'm wondering, uh, it's not going to necessarily be a free-for-all because there are strings attached to this money, right? Because they can't really go spending on things. It's it's pretty much reimbursements and, and basically ways to make sure that the state is complying uh, with health precautions dealing with COVID-19. Right. I mean, that, that money is, is very specific in that it's supposed to be, like you mentioned, dealt with reimbursing state agencies, higher education, State Department of Education, local governments for all their COVID-19 expenses. And, and like Jeffrey mentioned, that Accelerate a C subgroup uh, chaired by a former state senator, Greg Ryberg, proposed using a, a good chunk of those dollars for new things like the expansion of broadband internet. Mm. Um, that, that is a huge huge endeavor uh, to take in. And it's it's very hard to to see whether that is something that the legislature is going to be willing to to chew on in, in a week, in maybe a couple of days, depending on how long it takes them to, to go through this, this mini uh, COVID-19 budget. Uh, we do expect, obviously, the governor has final say over that, that wish list, over those recommendations. He's going to treat it very similar to how he treats an executive budget. Uh, I expect uh, that some of those numbers, uh, some of those uh, uh, spending projects might be a little different. Um, the House at least has indicated that they're going to treat uh, the Accelerate SC recommendations like a, a blueprint. So. I, we could see some definite changes. I think that's the expectation. The broadband stuff is very interesting because, you know, it's $100 million that they're putting in, which is, it would be a significant investment. And, I mean, in a state like South Carolina, which is a fairly small state geographically, I mean, you know, one thing you can be, you know, wherever you are in South Carolina, you're not that far away from a pretty big place, you know. So, I mean, if suddenly you can get, you know, broadband to everybody in every corner of the state, it opens up a lot of places to develop in a state that's already kind of booming. So it could be very interesting. 
Yeah, I was going to say, Jeffrey, if you want to you know, expound upon that, you know, we did hear the governor at one of the Accelerate SC meetings talk about, you know, it is time for there to be an expansion of this. Um, and, you know, the, the big snafu basically is that there's no broadband expansion plan for the state, even though there's been talk about it. You know, people pointed to the legislature and said, well, where's this plan? You know, we could have qualified for some federal funding in the past to, like, get some sort of improvements. But uh, now, as part of the, the, the money for the CARES Act, there's some money allocated so that there could be a plan developed and then there could be $100 million dedicated to infrastructure and some more money for hotspots. It just seems like this might be a little bit of a silver lining, I guess, if we're looking for one these days in terms of something coming out of this that will, will benefit South Carolinians. Well, you don't think about your roof until it leaks. And, I mean, you didn't think about rural broadband until suddenly all the kids had to learn online, <coughs> bunches of people had to work from home. So suddenly, you know, you realize, I mean, Molly Spearman, and the education superintendent talked about a teacher in Spartanburg who, like, you know, could literally didn't have broadband access, but could walk outside a house and like 800 feet down the street, somebody had broadband. I mean, mm -hmm. things like that. So once this has come up, I mean, it, it, it provides a very interesting opportunity. I mean, the thought in my head, you know, everybody thinks about the Great Depression sort of these days. I mean, this is kind of a sort of a WPA, a Works Progress Administration kind of thing where we could put in this effort build this out and suddenly it shows benefits 10, 20, 30 years down the road for South Carolina. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, and uh, some polling has shown that <clears throat> infrastructure is again, of course, a top concern. And, you know, we're not just talking about roads, we're not talking about sewer and water, we're talking about, you know, a necessity like uh, internet access, especially in this new day and age that we're living in. Uh, Mayan, I want to talk a little bit about some polling data we saw, <clears throat> sorry, come out this week, uh, talking about how some people were reacting to how the state has handled the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, the Palmetto poll from Clemson University showed that 51% uh, of, of their respondents were dissatisfied with the state's response to the COVID-19. 43% were satisfied. Uh, another poll that we saw from First Tuesday Strategies, they were doing a poll for the 1st Congressional District, uh, found that 51% approved of the job uh, the governor was doing. So it seems like it just depends on who you ask. I'm wondering uh, what kind of reactions have you been hearing from people about the state's response, the governor's response to this, now that we're you know, past this two-month mark, essentially? Yeah, I definitely think it obviously depends on who you ask and then what, maybe what, what portion, what factor when it comes to reopening or closing um, you ask about as, as well. Um, there's, two, there's two pots. I mean, there are people who obviously, I, I think everyone um, agrees that, that the public health is important, right? That we all want to be safe, that we don't want to see a second wave of COVID-19 in the fall or even next year. Uh, but depending on who you talk to. There are some folks who obviously had hoped that businesses could have stayed open, that uh, business owners could have been, uh, you know, responsible for ensuring that things like hand sanitizer and, and disinfectant were available, you know, mandating maybe that masks were worn, uh, but really letting sort of the economy continue, not, not shutting it off completely. Um, versus the, the pot of folks who really feel like everything needs to be completely shut down until uh, cases significantly go down. Uh, so the, I, I found that there are just varying opinions on this matter. I mean, I, I think with anything like this, whenever you close down uh, a sector of business or, or reopen it very quickly while cases are still rising, you're going to have different opinions. But in South Carolina, we, we didn't see quite the um, pushback, right, that we've seen in other states. I mean, certainly there were protests here, but we didn't have thousands of people show up to the state house. Uh, we had maybe a few dozen and then maybe a couple of uh, spotty press conferences here and there. Uh, so the fact that the governor, I think, has opened things up gradually, kept some things closed. Uh, he, as well as the state epidemiologist, Dr. Linda Bell, have really stressed wearing masks, social distancing. I think that maybe has eased some people's criticisms, but I, I, there is still going to be a pot of people who feel like we should not be frequenting insides of restaurants, going to hair salons, things like that, while cases are continuing to rise. And Jeffrey, you've covered disasters in this state for years as well. This one is obviously very unique and, you know, it's ongoing as we're still in it. Um, how have you seen, what have you been seeing, how the governor's walking this, this line? Uh, you have colleagues all across the country who are covering their governor's reactions to, to closing. We, we see regionally, you know, over in Georgia, there's been, you know, different reactions to how they've been handling things. What's, what's your read on this and how have you been hearing about how the governor's been handling this? Well, you know, if you just judge just took what the governor's dealt with in the past two months, how he spoke, what he said, his plans for closing and reopening, would you know or realize that he was one of President Donald Trump's first big supporters in this? I, I, he's done it, you know, I guess 
it's been a little bit, he's taken a very deliberate tack. And he hasn't mm -hmm. made this a very political thing at all. He's, he's dealt with it almost like a hurricane in reverse in a way. I mean, you know, I've, I've thought about this, you know, when he evacuates people, he takes a very uh, proactive kind of stance, maybe ushers more people out than need to go. On the reverse side of this, it's almost like he's got to send people into danger because, I mean, you know, they, by reopening stuff. But he's still taking a very careful and deliberate approach, and he's managed to stay just, just it was maybe like a half step behind the people that really want to reopen things, and a half step in front of the people that are like, oh, we're going too fast. Yeah. But there's been a very careful, deliberate process he's made that, I mean, it, it, there's been a couple of hang-ups. I mean, people were like, bugging him for weeks to go. You need to do a stay at home order, even though essentially what all he was all he was doing was everything was that stay at home right. would do, just not calling it that. So I think he's made a very interesting kind of almost a foot in each place that he's been very careful and cautious. Yeah. And I mean, I would say too, you know, when we look at how our state has handled disasters in the past, I mean, we've had years, back to back years of hurricanes. So we're no stranger to how to handle uh, certain processes. Obviously, we know we have a better idea of when a hurricane's going to hit the coast. We know what's going to happen. We know when we can reverse lanes and those kind of things and do evacuations. This, like you said, I think it was more gradual, but it seemed like it it has panned out. I mean, we did flatten that curve. Apparently, you know, we it's it's I think remains to be seen at this point how these changes, how people adapt to these new changes, and what what our future looks like at this point. Is that what maybe starts to become the next phase of evaluation about how well the governor is going to be doing? Yeah, I mean, I, and, and I mean, you know, there's, it, it's always what happens next, I mean, which we don't know about. I mean, you know, the, and, I, you know, the state, like you mentioned all the disasters, the one thing that was important was once the, the governor declared the state of emergency, things that have been, I mean, it's almost, that's a yearly thing around here now. You know, we, I think we've done it every, you know, we've had hurricane evacuations every year since either 15 or 16 in the mm -hmm. state. Because, you know, we haven't had one slam into the state yet, but we've had to get people away just because the uncertainty of the forecast. So... That, that emergency response wheels are very, they're, they're, that, that's a very fine-tuned machine. This is a little bit different, though. There's a recovery to it, but it's a, it's a different kind of recovery. I mean, it's not, you know, sending people to rebuild infrastructure and stuff like that. It's more of a confidence issue, more of getting people confident that they can go out and do things. And I, that, that's going to take a little more work and effort, a little more psychological effort than physical effort. Yeah, and I guess it, it did help, too, you know, that the Accelerate SC uh, task force. You know, that was the, the point of that, too, to kind of help guide everyone, get everyone on the same page. Uh, so, again, we'll see more details from the governor on that plan, too. But with about three minutes left, I want to get your guys' thoughts on, um, you know, again, we're going to see the lawmakers come back in September. This will be after June primaries. This will be before November elections. Everyone's up for election in the state house. you know, all your House and all your senators. Um, Mayan, what can we expect from this two-week session uh, you know, bills that are still in play that have crossed over from either the House or the Senate are still in play. Bills related to COVID-19 will be in play. Is it going to be, uh, I mean, what, how, what can we expect? Is it going to be a free-for-all? What, what do we What do we think? You know, I don't think that there's one word to describe it. Um, we were just talking about this earlier. If it's, <laughs> if it's, if it's anything like uh, May 12th when they were here for a day passing the continuing resolution, passing the sunny die resolution, uh, I think it's going to be a, a, a long a long form uh, sort of look like that. It's gonna be, I think, a very dizzying couple of weeks, a lot of legislative ping-ponging, a lot of maybe actual running <laughs> between, <laughs> between chambers. Um, I think it's going to just be a very, very high level of activity, probably a lot of stress, especially as they try to deal with this budget. And like you mentioned, it's it's right around the corner from the November election. So this is going to be the final time people can try and get their legislation passed, get things attached to the budget. There's just going to be a lot going on. Yeah, and Jeffrey, with one minute, I mean, we, you know, education bill could still be in play. I mean, things, these big ideas, these big issues are still going to be there when they return in September. How they get handled will be what happens we'll be watching for both education bills are still in play both the one that was passed by the senate earlier this year and the one passed by the house in 2019 you're gonna have to work something out on that we expect that to happen but what will that will be i don't know remember too i mean so bills that were passed either by the house or senate are in play but there's probably not going to be any kind of committee meetings or anything like that so there's going to be a lot of negotiation back and forth between leadership there's going to be a lot of tug and pull we got all every, no excuse absentee voting in one day on May the 12th. Yeah, you wouldn't see a lot of those things pop up that people agree <laughs> on, and suddenly they, you know, I didn't go into the day on May the 12th thinking that was going to happen. That was like completely like ah. So I mean, you know, there's there's going to be stuff like that that I think we, we don't even know about. But but my answer, I mean, maybe the single worst 
word is chaos. It's just going to be, but it's going to be a controlled kind of chaos because I have a feeling Speaker Jay Lucas, I have a feeling President Harvey Peeler in the Senate, and all the leadership in both chambers will have a game plan. Now, things can go awry, but it'll be kind of a controlled chaos, and there'll be a lot that happens those two weeks. Get your sleep, eat well, get ready. Yeah, well, the good thing is the, the bars will be back open then, too, so <laughs> <laughs> it'll help. <laughs> well, we'll be seeing, uh, again, a lot to watch over the summer and into the fall, and I thank you, uh, Jeffrey Collins with the Associated Press and my inspector with the state newspaper for bringing us some great perspective. You guys stay safe out there. Thanks, Gavin. You too. Good to see you, Gavin. To stay up to date on the latest COVID-19 news affecting South Carolina, check out the South Carolina Lead. It's a podcast that you can find wherever you find podcasts and on SouthCarolinaPublicRadio.org. We provide multiple podcasts a week to keep you up to speed on what's happening in the state related to COVID-19. From South Carolina ETV Studios, I'm Gavin Jackson. Be well, South Carolina.